All right, so the first um, sort of thing that I think we should probably talk about are dihybrid crosses, because those were in the second set of problems. I didn't have a lot of questions about the monohybrid crosses over the weekend, so I am going to kind of dive into the uh, dihybrid crosses. There was one in your note outline, I believe it was um, purple and white with, or sorry, it was all about uh, seed shape and seed color in peas. It was yellow and round. So yellow being dominant, round being dominant, and then uh, wrinkled and green. So I'm gonna choose something different because that's already, um, that's already done for you. And you can look at that one and I'm gonna wanna give you a second reference. So I'm just going to pick a couple other traits from Mendel's list there. Mm, probably, usually we, I pick purple and white and tall and dwarf, but I think I'm going to expand the range a little bit. Let's do pod color. Let's do inflated and constricted with tall and dwarf. So we have two traits, two characteristics, two characters. two genes, you can think of it that way. Can you guys mute yourselves, please? I can hear myself coming with feedback, thanks. And when we have two characters or two traits, two genes, we call that a dihybrid cross. So it's, we're gonna need a bigger box. So dihybrid crosses require um, a 16 square Punnett square rather than a four square Punnett square. The first set, the first time you do a dihybrid cross, if you're starting with true breeding parents, the 16 squares seems like it's repetitive, seems like it's too big, seems like, why do I have to do it this way? And I realize some of you have been taught not to do all 16 squares. I think it's a mistake. I always do all 16 squares. So if you've been already learned this a different way, that's fine, but on the quiz, especially on the genetics part of the quiz, I will expect you to show me all 16 squares. So let's pick two P characteristics, not pair, P characteristics. And actually, you know what, let's not, let's do uh, pumpkins because I never gave you the Halloween problems. So let's do pumpkins, which are really a type of squash. And let's do, how about this? Color, orange versus white. Those are our two alleles. And how about shape? Round and um, I think they actually call it oblate, but we'll call it oblong. Mm, let's do something else. Let's call it squat. All right, so let's say the problem reads like this. In pumpkins, round shape. No, you know what? I'm going to make it even harder. Let's say in pumpkins, a cross resulted across of true breeding parents resulted in all the pumpkins being all the pumpkins, let's say were orange and brown. So I've already told you what the alleles are here for color. And what I'm trying to get you to see in this little short part of the problem here is that if, if you are given F1 offspring in the problem, 
if you are given the phenotype, I should say, of the F1 offspring. Let's get that up in there. You should be able to figure out which is dominant and recessive, right? That's the trickiest part about both monohybrid crosses and dihybrid crosses. So if we're given the F1 offspring and we're told that all of the offspring are orange and round, what that tells us is orange and round are dominant alleles. It just is. Okay, when, they, when you're told what the F1 offspring, the phenotype of the F1 offspring, that tells you specifically which alleles out of your sets are dominant. So if we know that for color, there are two alleles, orange and white, right? And all the F1 offspring are orange. We know that orange is dominant. So I'm gonna make that a capital O. And since they're true breeding parents, they must be homozygous. So we need two capital O's for orange and for white, I'm gonna make, draw them as lowercase o's like this with a little tail on them to indicate that they're small letter o's. The same for the shape allele. So this was the color allele, the shape allele. We have two alleles also, and we're told the F1 generation is all round and they were true breeding parents. So this is F1, then this is the parent phenotype and then the, or sorry, the parent genotype, and then little r's, lowercase r's for, what did I say, squat? Remember, you can't change them to s's. Now, so we would set up, the next step would be to set up the actual cross. Now, we're gonna combine the dihybrid cross. So we have parents that are exhibiting orange, and round, and we are crossing them with parents that are exhibiting white and squat, like that. So these are this is the P generation. When we go to draw our Punnett square, again, we need 16 boxes now. And I understand all the alleles look the same. So you're thinking, why do I have to bother with all 16 of them? Everything is going to be the same in each of these 16 boxes. It's to help you practice where to put the letters, okay? So I'm gonna switch to a different color here. So again, I would put a circle around these parents and maybe a triangle around those parents. And then I'm gonna put the circle parents across the top and the triangle parents down the side. Remember what I'm putting inside these boxes are what genes, what can they possibly give in their sex cells at the end of meiosis to their offspring. So in the case of parent one here that's orange and round, they can only donate either a capital O or a capital R. Never, ever, ever, ever can they donate two O's because that would be like getting two copies of chromosome one in a sex cell, in a sperm cell or an egg cell, pollen grain or an ovule, right? And we want one from the female parent or the female part of the plant and one from the male part of the plant. So we can never have two O's or two R's together in the gametes. And again, even though this looks very repetitive, what I'm actually doing is I'm gonna number these one or A. Actually, I'm just gonna put a circle and a little star above each of them like this. Because what I'm actually doing is I'm saying, okay, what if this allele meets up with this allele in the egg or the sperm? And then what if this allele meets up with the R that has the little star above it? So I am actually going through all the combinations of capital O and capital R that are possible 
And the reason this becomes important is because if there's a mutation or a slight difference between any of these alleles, we might want to know wh which one the offspring ended up with. Now, the other parent, of course, we're going to put down the side, and I think you can see pretty quickly that it's just going to be a lowercase o and a lowercase r. Again, we have to keep them in the same order. We're going to put the color, and it's usually however it was described in the problem, right? Pumpkins, color in pumpkins is orange or white, and shape in pumpkins is round or squat. I usually keep the alleles in the same order that they're stated in the problem. Now, when we combine these alleles, remember we want to put the capital letter first because we're saying what happens if this baby ends up with the cross between this pollen grain and this ovule. So it would be capital O, lowercase o, capital R, lowercase r. And again, you can probably tell that that's going to be the same for each of these boxes. Again, why bother? Because I, I, think you should, I think you should do the practice, that's why. And then last but not least, off to the side here, you need to say all the F1 offspring, their phenotype is round, uh, orange and round, and their genotype is big O, little O, big R, little R. That's the easy part. Where it gets complicated is now when we try, if the question asks you, what would be the appearance of the F2 offspring? When they say, what would be the appearance? That means the phenotype, right? What do they look like? the F2 generation, the F2 offspring, they use similar words uh, to describe the same thing. So now we would have our, remember to get to an F2, you cross an F1 with an F1. And so the genotype of our F1, we would have orange, orange, round crossed with orange shirt. Yeah. Now to put those into the Punnett square, I'm gonna to try to make the Punnett square a little bit larger this time so you guys can see a little better. Remember, again, I like to put a circle or a square around them or some designation to help me remember which parent I'm talking about in which place, rather than putting male and female, which we're gonna do for the sex linked problems in a minute. Now, these guys, we need to place all the alleles for circle parent across the top. Now, one method to do that is to, and I spelled it all out on your handout for you very explicitly, but the shorthand is first, outer, inner, last. And what we mean by that is the first allele of each trait, the outer allele of each trait, the inner allele of each trait, and the last allele of each trait. So for example, in this case, the first allele of each trait would be the capital O and the capital R. The outer alleles for each trait would be the capital O and the smaller case R, lowercase r. This is the outer. The inner alleles are here, lowercase o, capital R, and the last alleles are both the lowercase. Do you have to do it in this order? Um, yes, if you want all the points and you want them quickly, right? This is the way we set it up so that everyone who's doing this problem, we can all share our results very quickly. Then you just need to fill in the box, which is the same as always, right? You need to take these two O's, this, if this pollen grain meets up with this ovule, we would get capital O, capital O, capital R, capital R. Remember we want to place 
the alleles for the same trait together. So we can very quickly say, oh, this one's round, orange and round. And then we would go through and fill out this whole table. And then we need to figure out what they actually look like. And we need to keep a tally or we need to write it down. Usually that hat occurs off to the side. Now we need to go through and say, okay, what does this one, what does this one look like? So let's see who's here, All right? All right, I'm just gonna go down the list. Uh, Aylin, what does this first one look like? What should I, what should I, what color is this and what shape is this? Um, well, the first one is both dominant homozygous. So if we're talking about the pumpkins, what color is capital O, capital O then? What should I write over here for the phenotype? Let's go back. So capital O, capital O gives us what um, phenotype? What does that look Sorry. like? Sorry, I That's cut out. So the first one's orange and round. Yep, orange and round. So we write the phenotype and then we put a little mark there to indicate that we're counting how many of those we have. Then I cross it off so that I don't uh, repeat. Angelina, you're next. What does this one look like? Orange and round. That one's also orange and round, very good. All right, Angelo, you're up. What does this one look like? Uh, also orange and round. Very good. I'll put my little squiggly line there. Emma, what does this one look like? Orange and round. That one's also orange and round. Thank you. I'll cross that one off. Uh, Leah, second row, first um offspring. What does this one look like? Orange and round. That one's also orange and round. Good. Uh, Lorraine. What's this orange and squat. Orange and squat. Yes, you found you've got the first one that's different. So then we have to write another phenotype here. Orange and squat. And we give it a mark. All right. All right. Who's next after Lorraine? Marissa. What does this guy look like? Orange and round. He's orange and round. Very good. So I'm going to cross him off that way. All right. Who comes after Melissa? Michael M. Orange and squat. That one's orange and squat. Very good. And I'm going to give that one the other way cross so that I can help keep track. Um, Mickey, is that your phone, Michael? No, I'm Kaya. This oh, is Mikaya. Okay. <laughs> okay, Micaiah, what's yours? What's this one? Can you see me here? This um yes. I, okay. Um, what does this one look like? Um orange and round. That one's also orange and round. Very good. Put that up there. And I'm gonna give that one a cross off that way. All right. Nahiba, what about this guy? What does this one look like? Orange and round. That one's also orange and round, very good. So let me put a line there. Who comes after? Uh, Nugen, what does this one look like? This one's a new one. Yes, no? Are you with me or only just <laughs> on your phone and then walked away? Does, what, is it, what does this one look like? Ask you to unmute. 
All right, I'm gonna skip you for now. Sharice, can you tell me what this one looks like? Sorry, white and That's round. White and round, yes. So we put that guy white and round and give him a one. And then what about this last one in this row? Who's left? A towel. What's this one look like? White and round. That one's also white and round, very good. All right, I think we're back to the top. Uh, Aylin, what does this guy look like? Um, orange and round. Very good. You, I'm sorry that you got two that were the same <laughs> <laughs> after all that. Uh, Angelina, what does this one look like? Orange and round. That one's also orange and round. Wait a minute, I've got too many orange and rounds. Whoop, whoop, this is a problem. Look, Dr. Stewart made a mistake. This should have been two little R's. My bad. Angelina, tell me again what this one should look like. If it's two little R's, what should it look like? Orange and squat. Orange and squat, thank you. And uh, Angelo, what about this guy? Uh, would that be uh, white and round? That one's white and round, excellent. And Emma, you get the big finale. What is this one here at the very end, my last box? White and squat. White and squat. Every time, guys, that's how I knew this was a mistake in this box here. Every time an F2 offspring, we should have nine to three to three to one. The ratio should be nine to three to three to one every time, unless it's some ab abnormality or some extension of Mendel and it's not a simple dominant and recessive alleles. Okay, does anybody have questions about this particular problem before I go on to a different kind? Is there a test tomorrow? There's supposed to be, it looks like on my calendar. But how about we have it on Thursday? Would that, would that upset anyone? No. <laughs> no, that wouldn't upset anyone. How about we move the quiz to Thursday? That way you have a little more time with these problems. So that is 11, 12, correct? Thursday? And if anyone like is just like, no, I can't do that because I have whatever, I have three tests that day or I'm, you know, I have to take my kids to school that day and it's their in-person day or whatever. Remember, it's open all day from midnight until, you know, from 12 a.m. to midnight. But if you really have a conflict, um, let me know. And I have lots of versions of this test. So you can take a special version just for you. So um, you can let me know about that. But I think that's probably a little bit better because um, I was hoping since we didn't have a lab this week that you guys would spend time working on the problems. But I realize everybody has whatever they're doing. And so um, it's difficult sometimes to do all the things that you hope to do on a Friday or a Saturday or a Sunday. So let's do that. Let's move this quiz and I'm gonna put it on my calendar here. Let's move the Mendel quiz to Thursday, quiz five. All right then, let's talk a little bit more about a couple other types of problems. Again, they're already on the first video, but I know you guys don't like to watch. Some of you don't like to watch them. So um, the pedigree we talked about last time, incomplete dominance, I'm just, and we also talked about multiple alleles, I believe we talked about blood type last time. So I would like to talk a little bit about incomplete dominance because that one's a little tricky. So the key to recognizing an incomplete dominance problem is that you have, similar to multiple alleles, you have a third phenotype, okay? So I think the examples usually in flowers because it's very common in flowers and plants to have incomplete dominance. But the book, the 
illustration that's in your book is we have some snapdragons that are red and some snapdragons that are white. And when we cross them, we know these to be true breeders. We cross them, all the F1 generation is pink. So not only do we have the appearance of a third allele, a third phenotype rather, I should say, but that third phenotype shows in the F1 generation, right? So if this was a regular monohybrid cross, we would expect we would find out if red or white was dominant based on the F1 generation, right? So if it was a problem like we just did in the pumpkins, and let's say white was dominant. Let's, well, that's never true. It's always the red. It's always the color, not the plain. So let's say red was dominant. We would expect all the F1 generation to be red. And then we would know, okay, red's the dominant allele, white's recessive. We would make them, you know, capital, capital, lowercase, lowercase. You can still do that, but what your F1 generation to designate the genotype of your F1 generation, it would be all this, all heterozygotes. So the F1 generation is pink and all heterozygous. Right, they are the large. In your textbook, if you looked at the problems, I believe they superscript the letters. So instead of using R and R, you can do it this way. That's fine with me. In your book, in the text, they do this. They do um, C for color allele, and then they superscript R for red. So the red parent for color has two capital R's, and they actually, just to throw you off, they switch to white. They switch to W for the white flower. This is it's actually, believe it or not, it's, it's plant specific. So depending on who was studying these plants and determined what the alleles were going to be called, that's kind of the system that we go with. I prefer in bio one for you to just do this because I think it's easier or simpler. If you would rather do it this way, that's perfectly fine as well, but you just have to keep it straight. Right, so this, the, all the F1s are going to still be pink, but their um, genotype is going to be this. Again, my advice to you when you get these problems, I always, I often do this off to the side so that I can remember. And then if I make myself this little key, then I can just look at the words in the problem and I don't have to think about it. Sorry. I can just, if they say uh, in uh, Snapdragons, for example, red is incompletely dominant over white. Uh, you have two pink flowers that are crossed. What will the offspring of this cross be? So for that particular, I'm going to erase some of this so I have space. So if, if it's, um, an incomplete dominance, you can assume that the parents are homozygous? It depends on what they tell you in the problem. I'm looking to see what I wrote on that problem. Let's see. Oh, it's the frogs, right? Yeah. So frog with dark green spots is mated with a frog with plain skin. Their offspring have a few light green spots and in between phenotype. These actually have names. It's a, it's a Japanese frog, um, but I I'm sparing you trying to say those names or spell them. Assign letters for this trait and show how it is transmitted from the parents to the offspring. What genotypes of frogs should I cross if I want offspring with all three phenotypes in one generation? Okay, so first we would have to decide, um, is this a sex link trait? Is it monohybrid, dihybrid, incomplete, multiple alleles? That's kind of the first thing. And from reading that first sentence, it tells you an in-between phenotype. So I would say, yes, this is incomplete dominance. So I have frogs with dark green spots and a frog with plain skin. So let's use green then. So I'm gonna use S for spots. So if I have a frog with spots and I cross that frog 
with a plain frog. So I'm going to give little s, little s for plain, no spots. Their offspring have a few light green spots. Okay, well, that makes sense because they're all going to end up being the in-between. All right, so they're all few spots. Okay, so that would be the first part of the problem. So I'd be looking that you could assign a trait, you know, assign letters, and then tell me that the in-between phenotype is this heterozygous genotype. All right, blub and show that's the end show how it is transmitted from the parents to the offspring. This is the showing part. All right? Show me basically show me the Punnett square. And then for the second part it says what genotypes of frogs should I cross if I want offspring with all three phenotypes in one generation? <laughs> you can go about that, excuse me, two ways. You can either do it by trial and error. That's probably what I would suggest at this point. So I would say to myself, okay, I already know that if I use a homozygous uh, spotted parent and a homozygous plain parent, I get only spotty frogs and I want all three. So this isn't the cross then, right? So myself, I would say, oh, what if I cross a, um, a spotty parent with a heterozygous? So I would draw that Punnett square. And let's see what I got here. Hmm. No, nope. looks like in this case, I get half of them are spotty and half of them are a few spots, right? So I don't get all three phenotypes. So that can't be it. So I have to try something else, right? Um, you could try, we already know what happens when we do this, right? So then I would try what happens if I cross two heterozygotes together. Let's see what happens there. And some of you can probably do this in your head and that's fine. You don't have to show me all of them. Mm, that's not gonna work. Oops, let me get, yeah. This guy, sorry. This guy's gonna be little less, little less, right? So big, 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 small, big, small. Oh, this would be the one. Yeah, because I've gotten, I got plain spots, like the original parent, dark green with spots. Got one of those. I have two of the in-between phenotype with a few spots and I have one with no spots. Perfect, I found it. What if I asked you that same problem? I'm gonna erase my flowers over here. What if I asked you that same problem and instead of, instead of the last question being, how can I get one with all three phenotypes? What if I said, how can I get the most frogs Or how can I, um, I don't even know how to do this myself. What if I, what the other one is what I'm after, I'm trying to say, right? What if I cross this one with homozygous, a heterozygous with homozygous recessive? I don't know how I would have to phrase that question because I'm not thinking very clearly today. Yes. Oh, so I guess that's the opposite of this one, right? So I would still have I would get few spotted and no spots. All right. So I could, I feel like I could ask you any of those three for outcomes. And again, you would have to just do it by trial and error and figure out which one was the right answer, which in this case, and the problem problems on your page, right? It's this guy. This is the cross I would have to set up. But what I would need to see from you for all five points is I would need to see this, right? And this, so these, both of these things. 
All right, the last thing that I want to talk about is a sex link treat because um, there's one on your problem on your paper, but I'm not going to use that one. I'm going to use a different one so that you can practice. Let's see if I can get one more whiteboard here. All right, so a sex link trait, and we are only doing um, sex linked traits basically from chapter 15. And we are going to talk a little bit about, um, I think I'm going to mention some anuploidy at the end here. Yeah. So in the case of sex link traits, those are genes that are on the X chromosome in organisms with X, Y, sex. Because this is important, not always is it X, Y to determine sex. It is in humans and it is in fruit flies, which is why we use fruit flies as the example for chapter 15. And the characteristics that I think we're gonna go through, I've listed them. That's not really true in chickens. They're a ZW system, but that's not important. Come to genetics, learn more about it. So an XY determination system like um, in humans, let's do uh, hemophilia. There aren't very many in humans. Hemophilia, colorblindness, and Duchenne's muscular dystrophy are the big three sex link traits in humans. So hemophilia is a disease where you are lacking a clotting factor in your blood. The most common version of hemophilia, I believe it's factor eight, um, but whatever you're lacking a clotting factor in your blood. So if you, you bruise very easily and if you uh, are cut, if you get a cut, you can't clot the blood. So you could in theory bleed to death. Sorry. So what that means is we will only, we'll rarely um, will females express the trait. So that means it's going to be more common in males, in male offspring. And we say females are carriers for the trait because they can have the trait. So we put a circle or we color them in half like this. They can have the trait, but not um, actually express it and they're carriers because they are going to pass it on to both their male and female children. Right, but it's gonna be more rare that the female child will be a um, actual hemophiliac. Um, let's look at another one. Let's look at color blindness. Right, because that doesn't kill you. It just makes it difficult to know what to wear, right? So colorblindness in humans is a sex link trait. So if we have a colorblind male and he mates with a normal vision female, Right, what would happen? What would the chance that their children would be colorblind? So what the added problem is you have to identify the allele on the sex chromosome. So this colorblind male, we would depict him like this. He is, it's, oh, I should tell you, it's a recessive trait, sorry. Recessive allele. So this colorblind male here is going to be it's going to be on his X chromosome. So he's carrying the trait for colorblindness, but his other sex chromosome is Y and it doesn't have the trait for colorblind or non-colorblind. But the female 
his normal vision female, remember XX delineates female, she has normal vision. So we're gonna put a plus there for normal vision and we don't know what her other allele is, but we're gonna assume that it's non colorblind. So we're just gonna give her two wild type alleles for colorblindness. And then once you do that, you can easily set up the Punnett square. And I'm gonna put the male here because across the top because he's the unusual one and the female down here because she's normal vision. Normal vision is dominant over colorblind. So the answer to the problem is going to be, oops, they are going to have, all their children are going to have normal color vision. But their female children are carriers. Or colorblindness, right? Because they they have one copy each. If we had a female carrier for colorblindness, Mary's a normal male. So he's normal. And if the female is a carrier for colorblindness, this would be how we would end up with male children that are colorblind. So this time I'm gonna put the female across the top again because she has the uh, unusual trait. So looks like this is a girl, female child, and she has normal vision. This is a male child with normal vision. This would be a female child that's a carrier for colorblindness. And then here's your colorblind male. Here, I'll make it green, such red green colorblindness. So they would have a one fourth chance right, or 25% chance of having a colorblind male child. So in the colorblind, uh, in the sex link trait problems, what the key words you're looking for, if they tell you it's a female carrier for the trait, right? Like I depicted here, anytime they say normal vision, um, we don't essentially know. That's why I put it this way, right? She could be this. And I just did the problem with her having normal vision and not carrying the colorblind trait, but she could have she could be carrier for the colorblind trait. We don't know. So again, sometimes you may have to complete two Punnett squares to determine, <laughs> excuse me, what the correct answer is for the for whatever they ask you in the problem. So I know that wasn't um, that was really fast, but I think there's a longer um, colorblind problem or a longer depiction in one of the earlier videos. Sorry. Okay, so now I'm gonna ask if anybody has any particular questions, but I don't, if I go back to being a screen where you see my whiteboards disappear, so I'm not gonna do that this time. So the, first off, does anybody have any questions about any of the problems that we just completed? So on the test, um, yep. Are you going to specify whether or not like the the normal vision female is heterozygous or homozygous? Um, it depends. So on the multiple choice portion of the test, if I asked you a colorblind question, I would be, expect you to be able to answer it really quickly. So I would probably be more specific. Okay. On the short answer portion, it may be because the nature of those are more open-ended, it may be that you have to do both the boxes to answer the question. Right, so the short answer is on the multiple choice part of the test, I would specify. On the short answer part of the test, I'm not sure if I did. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the short answer. But I believe the short answer section 
So there are different versions. And those of you that are in different sections of the course are going to get um, different sets. There are five of them and you're going to pick three. So you can, one strategy is to just pick the three easy ones, right? Every, every version will have a monohybrid cross and a dihybrid cross on it. So if you're really quick with those and those come easy to you because you've been practicing, pick those straight off. And then you just have to pick one of the unusual problems or one of the extension problems, which would be uh, a sex link trait, an incomplete dominant, a multiple allele, a co-dominant, excuse me, and or a pedigree in combination with one of those. And there'll be different versions, you know, completely different problems on the different versions of the exam of that part of the quiz for people in the different sections of bio one. And I believe that's not, that section's not timed. It's just open-ended, but a single submission. So be sure that you've written out all your answers before you click submit or take a picture of it or whatever you're gonna do or upload it. All right, other questions about this portion? Um, hi, I just have like trouble distinguishing between like incomplete dominance and codominance. Like how would you like distinguish between the two? So codominance, remember, um, if it's codominant, then both the alleles show in the phenotype. Not, not a new, it's, it's a third phenotype, but it shows both of them. So I'm going to stick with the flower color for incomplete. Right. And it's incomplete because it's a mix of the two alleles. So we have red flowers crossed with white flowers and all the F1 are pink. Right. A, although this doesn't happen. Right. This is this is just a completely made up example. If I used the same trait. Right. With codominance. And I said red is co-dominant with white in flower color of, I don't know, not tulips, because that's one of the problems on there. Let's say um, chrysanthemums. That F1 is going to look different. It's not going to be pink. It's going to be red with white stripes. It's going to be red and white. It's going to show both in the phenotype. All right, thank you. Right, does that make sense? Like, like with blood groups, right? So you can be A, B, you're A and B, this, you're red and white, right? That's co-dominant and that's still dominant over O, over blood type O. All right, so essentially um, incomplete is like a blend between the two uh, phenotypes and then yep. co-dominant is like, it shows both. It shows both, yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Questions, worries, concerns? Where does um, pliotropy fit into that? So that's sort of a totally different, um, I'm not gonna ask you any of those questions. Like blood type and stuff? Um, no, not so much in blood type. Um, pleiotrophy is more about like, um, so think about those I'm only going to ask you as a uh, definition, right? And Pleiotropy is more about variations of the severity of a particular disease, right? So they mentioned specifically cystic fibrosis and sickle cell disease as far as pleiotrophy, meaning that you have a single allele, a single character, but it influences more than just one part of the phenotype. 
So for example, with sickle trait, you not only have plain, like you not only have full blown sickle trait in some people, which gives you pain in your muscles, for example, but that can also, uh, you can also have other effects. Like when you have low oxygen in your blood, that could be, you could be lightheaded, you could um, faint easily, you could have low iron. So all of those effects in the phenotype, but it's only the result of a single characteristic, a single mutation. That's different from polygenic traits like skin color, where that is multiple genes, so multiple characters, and multiple alleles, and it's only affecting one part of the phenotype, this color of your skin, right? So this would be a polygenic trait, many genes controlling the expression of one part of the phenotype. Coat color, uh, coat color in dogs is not a good example because you're using that for epistasis, but um, it's uh, very common that um, the phenotype of skin or fur is polygenic. That's different from pleiotrophy. Pleiotrophy is one gene, multiple effects or multiple um, parts of the phenotype are affected. See what I mean? They're kind of opposites. Okay. All right, so other questions? comments, worries, concerns. And then of course I'll ask again on Wednesday since we're gonna have the quiz on Thursday now, which I think will be better for you. Wednesday, however, I will start chapter 11. I mean, sorry, Wednesday's the 11th. On Wednesday, I will start chapter 16, um, which is the structure of DNA and replication. And then we'll, um, next week, we'll cover transcription and translation mutations, and we will have another quiz. I will try, I will schedule that for the 24th. So I'll give you a little time to digest that. I'll try to keep that one the same on Tuesday the 24th. So it'll be quick, but it'll only be two chapters and there won't be these problems to do. It's more back to memorizing and um, sort of lists of things in a particular sequence. And there's a couple of videos that you can watch in that one as well. Okay, other questions before I shut down these boards? Um, hi, I have another question. Yeah. So I'm just wondering like what parts of chapter 15 will we need to know on the quiz? Uh, the parts that were covered in the lecture. So I believe that is the second um, section that has, I think it's lecture like three or four, I think it's lecture four, that has the sex linked traits, sex determination, and anuploidy. Those are usually the only three things that I um, regularly talk about. So sex link traits, which we covered today, and sex determination, which we just talked about. It's super short in your book, right? So in humans and fruit flies, we have the XY system. Xs are males. Um, XY are males. Two Xs, the homogametic situation is female. And then usually I do mention the ZW system where it's the opposite. In this case, in some fish, birds, and some insects, um, ZZ, the males are actually homogametic and the females are actually heterogametic. So it's reversed. Sex link traits and then anuploidy, which is a different number of chromosomes 
than the normal population. And so that's the, usually the standout example is trisomy 21, that's Down syndrome. Can't spell that. So that's an extra chromosome 21, trisomy three 21s. In humans, we do not tolerate usually organisms or offspring, zygotes that uh, start development usually don't make it very far in fetal development if they are aneuploids. There are very few aneuploids that are carried to term. They are mostly spontaneous miscarriages. This is one that is carried to full term. Um, the other aneuploids in humans that make it full term are aneuploids of the sex chromosomes. So I think your book lists um, XO, which we refer to as Turner's syndrome. That's uh, females. It's like one in 5,000 or one in 2,500 live births. X, X, triple X females. And then X, X, Y males that we call Kleinfelters. And um, super males that are X, Y, y that have extra Ys. So they're phenotypically male um, and um, normal. Same with the triple X females. They're, triple, they're typically females and um, develop normally and reproduce normally. Turners, they're uh, phenotypically female, but they are sterile. Same with Kleinfelter's males. They are phenotypically, mostly phenotypically male, although sometimes they do, uh, they fail to develop secondary, male secondary sex characteristics. They're treated in modern times, they're treated with um, hormones, with testosterone therapy when they hit puberty, but they still are sterile. Their um, testes never produce sperm. So I will double check that. I don't think from summer, those are actually on the test. I think maybe sex length is the only one. So this might be a, don't worry about it. I can tell you on Wednesday or I can post it in an announcement. I can look at that quiz and let you know that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, let me write that down because I'll forget. Where will I write that down so I can remember? Here it is. This is on this list. Check the short answer genetics problems. That's quiz five, I think, part two. I'll put uh, ain't quiz five. Let's just put check quiz five for chapter 15. Yeah, I'll do that, I promise, right after this, right after I'm finished here and um, post it in an announcement because people freak out if they watch this like at 10 o'clock this morning and I say that and it's, not true, so I'll try to do that immediately. All right, I 